Tobin Miller Shear. I'm an assistant professor in the history department and the coordinator of the African American Studies program. And I'd like to welcome you here tonight on behalf of the Martin Luther King Day Committee, its chair Mike Mayer, <coughs> President George Dennison, and the UM Excellence Fund, all who have contributed to making this evening possible. I first met Joseph Soret in the January of 2007 as part of the fellowship that we both held. We were at the Louisville Institute in Kentucky and I was tasked with responding to his dissertation, a brilliant treatise that studies the power imbalances between black artists and black church spokespersons during the Harlem Renaissance, the Black Arts Movement, and the Hip Hop Era. Having read his dissertation and his CV, I was rather intimidated. On paper, Yosef comes across as one badass activist and scholar. He's a Harvard grad. He's an ordained deacon in the Methodist Episcopal Church. He is a consultant to educational programs at the notorious Sing Sing uh, Correctional Facility, and he's an advisor to Harvard's African Hip Hop Research Project. After reading this, I figured that he would have no interest in hearing feedback from a lowly fellow doctor student. I could not have been more mistaken. I have since discovered in Yosef a sterling scholar and a friend, someone who is known for his intellectual creativity that is matched only by his humility and his genuine spirit. I have noticed at conferences that seldom is Yosef by himself. He draws people to him with both his mind and his mindfulness, his thought and his thoughtfulness. In his position as an assistant professor in the Department of Religion at Columbia University, with a joint appointment in the Institute for Research into African American Studies, he has already distinguished himself as a public intellectual, someone who has earned the respect of his colleagues inside the academy for the thoroughness and rigor of his research, but also has the ability to articulate insight into popular culture with vigor, creativity, and intrigue. He's one of the few people who I know <coughs> who is equally comfortable articulating the influences of prosperity preacher Creflo Dollar in the works of hip-hop artists such as Ludacris, 50 Cent, Lupe Fiasco, and at the same time being able to talk with his uh, colleagues in the academy about issues such as the various nuances and how we understand and articulate and study black power in the context of the civil rights movement. <clears throat> as you will discover tonight, Yosef has the ability to speak to broad audiences. People who may not know the difference between hip hop and bebop, as well as those who do get the reference in the title of his talk tonight. So I ask you, and it is my great pleasure, to introduce to you tonight Dr. Yo Yosef Sorit, who will be speaking to us on the, con on the topic of, for this evening, <coughs> Empire State of Mind, Civil Rights Politics in the Age of Black Presidents and Hip Hop Aesthetics. Please join me in welcoming him to our campus. Good evening. Good evening. You have to uh, 
uh, after having dinner prior to our conversation with Professor Shear and Professor Meyer, I am stuffed. I told them they might have to roll me in here. So you're going to have to help me wake up and shake off the dust of a very full meal at Pearl just a few minutes away. I, all right, is that an agreement? Well, this, we'll have a conversation tonight. I'll try not to drift off, and you do the same, I hope. All right? So good evening. Good evening. good evening. I want to thank Tobin, who has proven himself a master in PR, both in his kind introduction of me this evening, as well as in, in these wonderful flyers that he has created. I, had, I made a request that I would have, be able to take one home. For those folks who don't think I'm something special, I'll just show them one of these flyers. And uh, so I appreciate his hospitality, the invitation of both uh, Tobin and Mike the and Professor Meyer and the committee for the King Day celebration. It is indeed my privilege to, to be here for us to have this little conversation about the meaning of Dr. King's legacy, Dr. King's life for all of us as citizens of America, students in the University of Montana. I want to also, of course, thank uh, President Dennison and Kathleen Collins in the President's Office for her hospitality in smoothing out all that it takes to get someone from New York out to Montana. And I am arrived smoothly without any bumps or turbulence, which I'm told is rare. And so I want to thank her as well, as long with several of the faculty who I've had a chance to meet today and uh, engage in conversation. Uh, George Price, who I see there, uh, Paul Lauren, as well as Nathaniel Levto and Kyle Volk, who I had lunch with over at the hotel. It has been a pleasure to be introduced to several of the faculty here, and I look forward to engaging with you, the students, uh, here at the University of Montana this evening. Now, I was on a radio show this morning, and the, I, I was told going in that the, the show leans in a conservative direction, and the speaker asked me as an introduction, well, what, you, he said, you do know that Montana is a mostly white state. Uh, and I was a little troubled or confused by the question. I mean, I think I understood what he was getting at, but I kind of take for granted that Dr. King, at this point, right, is embraced as uh, an American figure, right? That, that black identity, I think part of what this age of black presidents suggests is that we must not and cannot necessarily understood, understand blackness as something that ought to be understood in, in opposition to what it means to be American, right? Long ago at the turn of the 20th century, Du Bois writes of double consciousness, this way of understanding blackness as inherently opposed to what it means to be American. So if we take anything perhaps from the election of President Obama is that in this moment what many folk want to hail as a post-racial era, we can think about blackness in ways that devise this typical understanding about opposition to the American state. And we can also recognize that in a black Baptist preacher from Atlanta, we have an American citizen that means much for all of us regardless of our racial background this evening. So I count it a privilege that this moment, this evening, to lead us, facilitate us in a conversation that will both commemorate and meditate on the meaning of Dr. King's life and legacy for us in the 21st century. And as you have already been told, my talk for this evening, as you've seen in those wonderful flyers, the title is Empire State of Mind, Civil Rights Politics in an Age of Black Presidents and Hip Hop Aesthetics. And so what I thought we would do for a moment is, is think for a second about what this category, this term post-racial means. How many of you have heard this language thrown around since the election of President Obama? I'll say, so it's not a new term, it's a, not a new category, but often in circles, at least from my academic colleagues, right, when we use the language of post-racial, we're very quick to put it in quotation marks. We won't venture to say post-racial and, and believe that it has meaning, yet, I think that if we linger for a few moments on this language of post-racial, we might be able to learn some things about how race has changed, evolved, how it informs all of our lives in this age of a black president. So we might think about post-racial in two ways at least, right? On one hand, and I think this is what 
encourages a certain degree of academic skepticism, we sense in this post-racial language a desire to deny the persistent realities of injustice and oppression that continue to shape our everyday experiences, right? We, we sense that folks want to run on to the promised land that Dr. King talked about where race no longer matters. And Obama seems to be evidence that we're in this moment. We can elect a black president. Let's just stop thinking about race. I, too, put brackets around that type of post-racial language. But we also might think about post-racial in a different way, right? As we celebrate Dr. King before we rush to judgment, on racial equality, we can recall that Dr. King himself made a move towards the end of his life that might be read in hindsight as post-racial, right? Shifting from the race-based language and activism that led to the March on Washington, as he begins to plan the Poor People's Campaign, there's a sense that, that these problems that we're wrestling with are not simply about race, right? That there's this class dynamic, there's this economic dynamic. How do we account for the fact that not all poor people, not all people at the bottom of the American dream are black or brown, right? How are black and white poor people linked together in urban and rural settings? Dr. King himself, if we think now, was making this move to think in more complicated ways, shifting from simply racial civil rights to human rights, what have you. So we ourselves this morning might invite this language to move towards perhaps a more complicated read of the way in which the cultural and political landscape of the United States, right, has changed. A more sophisticated analysis, perhaps, of social difference as something that still includes race. We can't deny America's racial and racist history and the way in which that, that continues to resonate in the contemporary moment, but it also encourages us to account for class and gender and sexual orientation and ageism and the complexity of human spirit that can never be reduced to whether one of us finds ourselves as black, white, or other when we check that box that marks our racial classification. In fact, as I was flying out yesterday and I stopped over in Minneapolis and purchased a couple of magazines and Esquire magazine with Blake Lively, Gossip Girl on the front of the cover, and uh, Vanity Fair, which has Tiger Woods on the cover. Of course, I'm reading with a conversation that we'll have tonight in mind, but it's impossible to ignore the way in which race runs throughout each of these magazines. So as I'm flipping through the pages, on one hand, I'm reading accounts in which Obama is not as black as Rod Blagojevich, right? This now disreputed governor, former governor, right? Where Rod, Rod Blagojevich claims that he is more black. Obama's white black, but he, in light of his persecution, is more black. But, 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 but beyond that, we find Jay-Z is hailed both as an American icon and in the language of this uh, Esquire writer, a black, black god. We know he likes to refer to himself as Jehovah, right? And then in addition to that, there's the claim that, and we can watch as we observe Tiger Woods' trials in recent months and weeks, that he very quickly gets reduced from a man recently graduated from Stanford in the 90s who claimed and identified himself as Coblination, right? That as he, as police arrive on the scene, he simply gets reduced to that black man, right? The kind of complexity of racial language, no matter how we choose to define ourselves and the fact that we're all mixed up with one another as an American citizen, that the persistence of this racial binary, black, white, can reduce Tiger Woods, the first, what, billionaire? Just, it's, it's ironic that at the moment that he's being identified as the first billionaire athlete, he falls so quickly that all of a sudden his history, this underside of his ascent comes to the fore and reduces him to a black man on the streets of, what, Tampa, where, where, in Orlando, just outside Orlando, Florida. I think all of these things, alongside of the fact that we're forced to overcome with the overwhelming disproportionate number of black and brown men and women who are undereducated, who end up behind, bo bo behind bars, who die overseas in military service, and who contract HIV and, a a HIV and ultimately die of AIDS in disproportionately number disproportionate numbers, while race is increasingly complicated, confusing, perhaps contradictory, 
It very much still matters in ways that beg us to linger for a few moments, as I hope we have just done on this question of what does post-racial mean. I want to turn for a few moments by way of the title of my talk this evening to think about how hip hop in some ways invites this conversation around this post-racial moment. Hip hop as the soundtrack that ushered in, if you will, this so-called post-racial age. We can think about hip hop's own journey from the margins, often the story is told of hip hop taking place, this kind of creation myth of being created something out of nothing in this Bronx in which the Cross Bronx Expressway has just been run through, dissolving communities, arts education programs had been removed, and out of nowhere there is this creation, kind of creation ex nihilio, out of nothing we have this Garden of Eden perhaps that forms in the Bronx and gives us the voice of a dispossessed and marginalized group of black and brown young people who were, if the story tells it right, were plugging in their, plugging in their boxes to sound, hijacking sound system from the city, break dancing on the walls and all was well in the Bronx at least for a few minutes. We might have some suspicion about this, but net, the still we can track the way in which hip hop has made this journey from the margins, the voice of the margins, to the mainstream. Arguably the most popular form of popular culture, the world renowned, right? Um, and I would ask this, well, how many of you, I'm told not, not everyone is familiar with the song, but how many of you are, know what I'm referring to in titling this talk, Empire State of Mind? So the vast majority, I guess by titling it this and by you showing up, I'm inevitably preaching to the choir, right? Folks who didn't understand it didn't show up, right? That's, <laughs> unless Tobin is giving you extra credit, unless Professor Shear is giving you extra credit this evening. Well, of course, I am referring to the Jay-Z and Alicia Keys song, Empire State of Mind, which has its own unique history, this, this song that reflects on a New York state of mind, if you will, and long before Jay-Z has this song, we go back over 20 years to a not quite hip hop figure. I'm sure many of the faculty will at least recognize the New York State of Mind song that became so popular when Billy Joel chose to leave Hollywood and move back to New York is a different type of tone and sensibility to Billy Joel's kind of romantic and nostalgic remembrances of New York City as he returns to the city that he loves. But after Billy Joel, this idea of New York York informing our states of mind is a popular recurring theme in hip hop music. And what I want to do is play two clips. I want to play first this song. I must, it must have been early 80s by Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, right? Most popular for their social critique in The Message, but around the same time they recorded New York, New York, big city of dreams, but everything in New York ain't always what it seems. You might get fooled if you come from out of town, but I'm um, down by law, I know my, my wife tells me I'm a wannabe New Yorker, I'm, I'm from Boston. But so the songs, it resonates with me in a way that perhaps I shouldn't have ownership, you'll forgive me for that. So I wanna play this song, and then I wanna play, well, and I will play the video and you'll forgive their outfits and we will wonder why hip hop is so popular when we see this video. Um, but I wanna play this video and then play that video that has give it, been given much more airplay in recent years, the Alicia Keys video. And, and we'll also keep in mind that in the middle, a story of New York was also told by Curtis Blow. Eight million stories in the naked city, some ice cold and told without pity. All right, I will uh, unmute here. I will computer screen so I know what I'm doing. And this, so this is New York, New York. And do I need, sound should be all set? We should be good, we, yeah, sound looks like it's up. Let's hope it works. There's New York. I think this is pre-sound on the, on the clip. But no, I think sound should definitely be playing by now. <laughs> we'll leave it up there and try to play with, um, oh wait, oh there, there is this. Doing that, yeah. That should be, they're laughing at this. Yeah, that should. Don't worry, we'll let you get the whole song, if we can get the sound under control. Wait. 
Is this? Yeah. Did you get that little sound menu up? There's a sound here. Um, menu here? This here. And then. I'm not hearing it at all. Wait, there's something. You hearing something? Okay, well, while we are trying to get the sound, what I, I'll give you some clues in the narrative that I think the juxtaposition of these two videos. We have some help. Excellent. Uh, so, clear, right? If we think about the path of hip hop to the mainstream, in this first video, despite the leather outfits, right, and what have you, the story of New York is one that is told of this cold place, the story of the city where things are fallen, where things are broken, where people are being torn apart, losing their mind by the forces of the city beating down on them. Are we not going to, we may not, I, unfortunately I don't know the lyrics to the entire song, and that might be painful as you can tell from the few that I've, um, I gave up those aspirations in eighth grade, you know. <laughs> Is this sound here? Is this more sound, maybe? No, no, no. It's Is there something not plugged in, maybe? Oh, no, thanks for trying. I appreciate it. Yeah, no. All right, well, we'll assume that we're not going to have any sound. If indeed it comes to us eventually, we'll, we'll pause. And so, but what I think in this ascent from hip hop on the margins to the mainstream, is that something? All right, I'm hearing things now. It's, that's hopefulness. Um, we have the story of black young people in New York City on the margin struggling, beat down, and not just black folk in the account, the story uh, that transcends lines, but of New York as this place where folks' lives are crushed, right? Where folks lose their mind, where folks are broke and struggling. It's this story of urban power overtaking people's lives in a way that they can't manage. But now when we get to Jay-Z's New York state of mind, right, which gets performed in Yankee Stadium as the Yankees are about to win, much to my Boston chagrin, the World Series, we have a different tale of New York. We think about some of Jay-Z's claims from crack game to courtside, from bed to billboards, right? From Brooklyn to Tribeca, where he's now neighbors with Robert De Niro, right? There is a different type of, type of story about his relationship to America that reflects the way in which in this so-called post-racial moment, someone like Jay-Z who can admit and acknowledge his connection to a dr drug dealing game in New York can now have a cologne coming out, right? Can have a line of hotels that are going to be part of his entourage. Who can be a co-owner of New York restaurants alongside of the New Jersey, soon to be Brooklyn Nets, right? So the song becomes the embodiment of the possibility of the American dream for Jay-Z, this poor kid from the projects in Bed-Stuy, right? Dreams made possible only in light of the gains of the civil rights movement. Concrete jungles, Right? Concrete, concrete jungle dreams, streets that will make you brand new, big lights that will inspire you. All of a sudden, the pathway from Brooklyn, the pathway from the Bronx, right, which in Bonfire the Vanities cast as the wasteland that Manhattan, per, uh, Manhattanites would only wander into by accident only to their detriment and demise. Now the pathway from the Bronx to Midtown, from Bed-Stuy to Tribeca, is something that is seemingly possible without much struggle. Right? What does that tell us about the way in which hip hop generation, the way in which someone like Barack Obama, the way in which post the gains of the civil rights movement, the possibilities might be perceived as limitless, right? And in some ways would downplay Jay-Z's struggle even while he tries to hold on to his connections to Biggie or to Bed-Stuy, that he is now able to reconcile CEO with crack dealer in ways that are seemingly fluid, right? So hip hop challenges us, I think, invites us to move beyond eight million stories of people being oppressed to this story of Jay-Z as eight million stories rising, even though in the song he admits that half of y'all won't make it, even though he, like special ed, has got it made. So this song invites us as perhaps a stand-in 
to the possibilities and challenges of the hip hop generation of the post-racial era to ask questions regarding the legacy of civil rights politics, the meaning of post-racial rhetoric, as well as to the insights into the tension that hip hop performs between civil rights politics and post-racial rhetoric that are on full display even in hip hop's short 30 plus year history. So what I wanna do as we think about opening up into conversation is say something very briefly about each of the three categories that form my title. One hand, civil rights politics. On another hand, this age of black presidents. And third and finally, cultural, uh, cult, uh, hip hop aesthetics, right? One is about politics, the other is about history, and the third piece is about culture. When we think of civil rights pro politics, we often think of the 60s, we often think of Dr. King, and there are three things I think even within that category that we might think about, right? This idea of black identity as opposed inherently to the state, as governed by a posture of protest, themes of sacrifice and solidarity and struggle, right, in working to that promised land, right, drawing on that biblical motif of Exodus wedded to this Baptist tradition, to this civil religious tradition of America living up to the promise of its creed. But in addition to this, this kind of eschatological hope of opposing the reality to the promise and the possibilities of this vision, we also can think about kind of the public and private dimensions. That while King stands in as representative for the movement, he was very much himself the product of a black elite, middle class, son and grandson of preachers background, right? And so that even now, what, two weeks after the death, one week after the death of that author of the People's History, Howard Zinn, we are called to recount and think about everyday citizens' roles in these struggle. We think of Ella Bakers and Bayard Rustins and the countless nameless folks who were involved in this struggle, right? The dichotomy between the media representation and the reality of everyday lives that made that struggle possible within the context of the United States, that made possible someone like King to be elevated to the forefront, to project a voice, to represent the struggles of the countless and nameless few. And then also, as I've suggested at the beginning, we might think about civil rights politics as defining all of us in this question of what it means for us to be American. Right, as I was in the uh, conversation with Professor Price earlier today and looking at a quote from, I believe it was, uh, Where Do We Go From Here, one of King's books, of whether we as Americans will allow ourselves to de be defined by desires for wealth and prosperity or power, or whether we'll hold fast to this theme of justice that seemed to govern both King and Baker in the everyday lives of struggles of folks who rallied around him. What will be at the center of our American identity when we, if we embrace the sense of post-racial identity? Will, will it be because we perceive the benefits of wealth, prosperity, and power, or because we have a sense of justice still being played out in more troubling and more complicated ways than simply race? Secondly, in terms of what do we mean when we say the age of black presidents, right? Possibilities, opportunities unimaginable in King's lifetime. Largely made possible because of those struggles, those, those lives being laid down and what have you. Right? We think when we think about the age of presidents invites themes of arrival, of equality, perhaps even of conquest and of empire. What does it mean? right, for a black man to be at the head of the American empire. That causes our connection to civil rights politics and black power to be radically reimagined. What does that mean for Obama to be arguably the most powerful man in the world, for that man to be black, right? And we can, there's been work, Cora Daniels, that challenges us to think about how black power, right, this and even within Obama's campaign efforts to label him as a black nationalist, right, as this radical vision, the way in which black power is reimagined by Obama's generation, by folks who are not only president of the United States, but president of AOL Time Warner, Dick Parsons, presidents of American Express, Kenneth Chenault, all three black men. Now, we of course want to ask the gender question, where are the women in this, and how does patriarchy and male privilege still inform this? But we think about possibilities across racial lines in new ways in this age when we have black presidents all across these various types of mainstream institutions, right? How does that create new possibilities and give cause for many folks to not 
who are part of this generation, who are witness to a black president from my own son who's two years old, to feel a disconnect to the civil rights politics that's always understood. There are legitimate tensions that come from a generation that grows up in a moment when it's conceivable to elect a black president. Yet and still I think what this also raises, which I think is so important about hip hop's lesson, is that there is also evidence of the mixed results of civil rights politics. There are many scholars who are now quick to identify the fact that those who benefited most from the civil rights struggles and activism were those who were already privileged to be part of the middle class. So that at the same time we have a fast growing black middle class, we have black CEOs, we have an equally fast if not faster growing black underclass. Right? The class divide within black but also across America at large has grown exponentially in the years since the struggles of the civil rights movement. It was in, in almost as if in effect as King is pushing towards class that that move moves off the American radar. New policies emerge that reinforce this divide and in fact that black underclass is that group of people most commonly associated with hip hop music as that voice speaking back in light of the shift from a war on poverty to a war on drugs. In fact, in that shift from a war on poverty to the criminalization of black youth to that large number of black youth who now enter into their schools and cities across the country through prison paraphernalia of sorts, right? Who enter through metal detectors into high school. How does that change the way in which you imagine your educational experience and how does that bump up against the possibility of aspiring to be black president when it seems you're being socialized to a prison industrial complex. We think about the mixed results of the civil rights movement. And then finally, hip hop aesthetics. I think as this strange synthesis of the two, all right, a simultaneous opposition and embrace of all that is imagined to be American. Right? I can rage against the machine such that it enables me to actually make a leap into wealth. Right? Jay-Z can sell his oppositional identity, right? that then raging, this hip hop voice of opposition becomes itself a marketable commodity. We can, we can kind of perform our oppositional identities as a way to celebrate and embrace and take advantage of all that is an American. And so in fact, I think as Jay-Z's song perhaps unwittingly reveals, the hip hop's move from the margins to the mainstreams, right, once again reveals the way in which black identity is as American as American pie with all the challenges and pitfalls, right, of being the most powerful nation, with all the blessings and the privileges, yet at the same time call to task about our ties to violence, our ties to reinforcing disparities along the lines of race, gender, and class. Just by way of closing and opening up for conversation, I think as we, and we were having a great conversation over here on the way from the restaurant, and Professor Mayer was reminding us of our task in, in, in academic community, right? While many of us wear different hats, Tobin uh, shared that I get involved in a number of activities that may perhaps be considered activist and not academic, but as a academic community here, reflecting on King's legacy, meditating on his meaning for our own life, we might think about those pressing moments, right, that I believe Dr. King would direct our attention to in this evening, uh, even more so than my interest in hip hop music. Three things that call attention on one hand to the question of race and gender, on another to the issue of race and class, and another to the interest of race and human rights on a global scale. Right, and I am not venturing to be a policy analyst. I would simply say that my skill set does not extend nearly that far, but I think that these are issues that we all are challenged to think about. At the intersection of race, gender, and class, we can continually think about debates that are waging now about the disenfranchisement, the inequitable resources allocated to our gay and lesbian brothers and sisters. We think about debates around marriage equality, right? Which black preachers in King's legacy have figured very heavily, heavily and often as perceived blame for the passing of Prop 8, right? Which took away marriage equality rights in the state of California. We think about race and gender and sexual orientation as one of the contemporary frontiers of where civil rights work needs to be done. And that's not to conflate the two movements, but to 
to recognize the way in which they're part of a shared conversation. Along the lines of race and class, another right, minefield that Obama is waging through is health care. Right? And we, yes, we could debate all the problems. Again, I'm not going to do that. But we want to think about whether we think, whether we treat health care as something that's a fundamental right for all human beings, or whether it's something that ought to be just for those who can afford it. Right? So what does health care say about our values as Americans? What do we think ought to be extended to all people at this point? And then finally, just over the last couple weeks, we of course cannot have a conversation like this tonight without thinking about Haiti. Right? And the way in which right, this first and only black state in the Western Hemisphere remains dislocated in large degree from its brothers and sisters in the human and the global community just so close by, right? Even across the island with the Dominican Republic with its own challenges, but in relationship to the United States, right? In its relationship to the nation of France, right? It's from which it, uh, now, and, and we think about the ways in which that discourse has been in the public media, not only to discount Haiti, but to dehumanize, right? To kind of write them off as deserving some type of fate, as if the island should somehow, just that half of the island should kind of just disappear off of the national conversation. I think both Haiti, healthcare, and the question of our LGBT brothers and sisters in this country beg the question of how, where we do our work. As we move from meditating, reflecting on Dr. King's legacy, as we think about what work our careers, our degrees will do in this world, how we carry on the legacy of both taking our, what we're learning, our thinking, the privilege as a relatively small minority who are privileged to a higher education, how we use that education as we go from a place like this to do work, to carry on the legacy that Dr. King and so many others le left their lives on the line for. I thank you for this, I, I, for this invitation again, for the, and I look forward to hopefully a conversation for your thoughts, your feedback, your critique as we move forward. Thank you. And I'm sorry we don't have the music, right? I, I know Jay-Z is a better headliner than I am, so I, I apologize. But well, we have lots of time for conversation, and Yosef deliberately chose to uh, shorten his remarks so that we can be in exchange. So I'm going to turn it back over to Yosef and invite your questions, comments, and responses as much as our time affords. Yeah, do you think that the middle class uh, embracing uh, black culture as well as African American culture is um, kind of condescending in a way? It's in a way in which they don't truly try to understand the suffering of African Americans. So it, when you say middle class, meaning like the fact that 70% of people who purchase hip hop are white suburban youth, like is it? Well, I think right. I think there's there's a long tradition of American in American culture of kind of whether you go back to the jazz and the blues that right of. Uh, David Levering Lewis writes about the Harlem Renaissance as the moment when the Negro was in vogue, right? Citing the poet Langston Hughes. There's a way in which black culture has always been central to America's popular culture and it's always been in, if you will. But I think, right, that that has to be held in tension with the way in which these racial disparities persist, right? So, the, the, this, and in fact, there's, there's this recent work called In Search of the Black Fantastic, Richard Eitner, actually professor at uh, Northwestern where Professor Scheer graduated, who points out the irony of the fact that often in marginal communities, right, culture is hyper popular in the face of politics being this constant force of marginalization, right? Almost in fact, the, the irony is that the more marginal often, the more popular your cultural art forms can be. So I, I think you kind of point to some of the irony of the, the way in which race works in American society. It's great. All the way to the right. No. Do you see, uh, I don't know Jay-Z, I don't listen to his music, and I don't know his politics or anything, but were you kind of suggesting that there's a trajectory from Martin Luther King to him? Hmm. But I see a complete disjuncture in that King was talking about solidarity, and as you mentioned later on in life, he started discussing class. Mm -hmm. And Jay-Z seems to be, uh, more focused on individual <coughs> and maybe he, I'm sure he's aware of his lifestyle, how that affects 
other people and you know what that's based on. But there seems to be a disjuncture between the two for me. No, I agree. Yeah, I would not. I would not try to chart Jay Z as the heir to King's legacy. I know um, that he is thinking through how he can make contributions to society in the way that many. Uh, Folks who acquire a lot of wealth in a relatively short amount of time think about philanthropy. We, you know, think there's a long history of that in American society as well. Um, and him, alongside of other uh, hip hop artists, have been involved in trying to provide some relief to what's going on in Haiti. Um, but I think you're right, right? I think there's a way in which Jay Z or um, right a number of African American leaders. Uh, in uh, various spheres at this po point because of the new possibilities that don't, that don't rule you out solely because of your racial identity that, for the acquisition of wealth and leadership and power and that black power in some ways uh, is reimagined in light of those positions and possibilities. So his economic wealth on a very individual level might be perceived as a way of realizing the possibilities of Black power, which is, you know, right, as you identify rightfully, kind of a question that is perceived individually, right? So he becomes a model, an example of American individualism, right? This, uh, again, a long American tradition of the individual pulling oneself up by the bootstraps and uh, experience all the, experiencing all that America has. So I, th I think you're right to kind of co make the distinction between King's kind of sense of collective struggle and the, the way in which, uh, right, movements now, if you think, look at hip hop, they're often defined on ep economic terms. Right? Wu-Tang has a movement, they're gonna take over the industry, which means they're all gonna become millionaires, right? Same with G-Unit, right? And uh, so, I, and I think the fact that someone like, as uh, Professor Shear indicated in my remarks uh, in his introduction, someone like uh, someone like uh, Fifty Cent, some, whether it's uh, Fifty Cent or Ludacris or Outkast, they're not citing. Uh, preachers or preacher politicians like King who are in the civil rights struggle, they're citing someone like Creflo Dollar, right, who makes a cameo, vid cameo in, out in an outcast video, who's cited explicitly by 50 cents in a, in, in a G-Unit song, who becomes then uh, Mason Betha, right, Mer formerly Murder Mace, Minister Mace, his pastor, right, who is perhaps the most public and popular black proponent of the prosperity gospel, which equates, right, God's blessing with being rich. So I think that kind of shows some of the shift, the generational shift in terms of uh, kind of both in where churches are as well as in terms of models for what might be understood as black power. Thanks. I was just going to say, uh, I know Dr. King said something along the lines of uh, freedom lies in the hands of disciplined nonconformists. And I really appreciate the fact that you say it's not just an issue of race, but there's other issues at hand in this country that need to be addressed like classism, uh, like I said, lesbian, lesbian, gay, bi, everything like that, so it's much more than just race. Right, and, I, and, I, I, well, I, and I appreciate that, and I think, right, if, right, the post-racial rhetoric, it's not going anywhere. People are going to continue to appeal to it. So if folks of like mind, right, can flip that rhetoric towards the end of a more complicated notion of struggle, acknowledging how race has shifted, we can perhaps maybe co-opt, I don't know, shift that discourse a little to invite and foreground questions of power and politics that can't just be reduced to race. Yeah, well, come on. Um, in the previous question, you said that the marginalized cultures had a uh, very hyper-popular. Yes, I was, yeah, right, right. Yeah, um, I'm wondering why they remain marginalized if they're so popular. Why they remain, well, they, right, I think, the way in which we m measure marginality on one hand would suggest that right, black cultures are central to American culture imagination, but that kind of culture, in po there's a disjuncture between what culture, the work that culture does, and not that it doesn't play a role in political struggles, but they're not to be conflated, right? So a Jay-Z song may give us an image of, uh, you know, uh, popularity and also power, but that doesn't translate into something that affects policies that change the conditions experience, right? That doesn't all of a sudden lead to funding in public schools in Brooklyn where he, maybe he'll take over a school, right? Which he very well could do. He could probably fund uh, Brooklyn public schools in a way that would, I mean, these questions get raised all the time. Why don't professional athletes do that in a way that would lend itself? But, uh, you know, professional athletes, so many of whom are African American, uh, could, in, in fact, uh, use the resources in ways that do, and some of whom are doing this work in Haiti. But 
Uh, the disjuncture between cultural popularity, cultural centrality, and the political realities. Um, yeah, they, they're, they're two totally different games. Yes. Yeah. Oh, then we'll come down here. Yeah, back there and then here. So it seems that there's a lot of similarity between gaming and the mindful movement and the stuff that you know, and kind of really abandoned and how the media focused on certain aspects of what was really going on. We were able to see this reaction down there. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's right. For those of you who didn't hear, the, the connection was made between Hurricane Katrina and the earthquake in Haiti and what's happened in New Orleans, right? And the way in which uh, kind of the racial dynamics and what are at stake in the history of that, that city, right? Which has its own legacy, right? It's kind of one of the birthplace of jazz music, um, Louis Armstrong and what have you. This, um, yet this also kind of this historic black community that was washed away, right? Um, seemingly disregarded or what led Kanye to say what George Bush doesn't care about black people right the limits and perhaps well I don't want truth in certain hip-hop claims we'll just say um, but limits uh, to that racial rhetoric there right yeah no I, th I think you're exactly right right that um, often there's talk about developing countries or third world countries overseas and if we turn our attention to parts of our own country that are significantly under-resourced, underdeveloped, and overlooked and ignored, if you will, and which oftentimes can be mapped along you know, racial categories. When you think about of the, uh, all of the prisoners in the New York State Correctional Facilities, uh, I think, and the statistic is now probably a few years old, but it was something like 70 to 80% came from seven zip codes in New York City. Right, that just so happened to be primarily populated by black and Latino. Um, yeah. Sorry, you were waiting. <laughs> we better get you out of here, don't we? No, no, no. I don't want to take advantage of any opportunity to have down in the Can I defer that to your professor? I'll, I'll, you can answer and I'll grade you. <laughs> oh, even better, even better. How did the civil rights, whoo, that is. Yeah, the question was, I think provoked by this guy over here, um, how did the civil rights movement affect change? Initiate change. Wow, I mean, I think, um, there would have to be a number of different variables, right? So, of course, I think grassroots organizing, right? There's attention that's been paid, play, paid to it's the Highlander Institute, right? That had strategies and curriculum around community-based organizing. Um, so you have organizing taking place within churches or what have you, kind of building a sense of the kind of stages of nonviolent protest and the work that that did. Um, that kind of builds a mindset around engaging for the difficulties of the work. I think you have strategic engagement with media. Um, so kind of highlighting that struggle that brings and kind of pricks the nation's imagination and gets a vestedness of not just those involved in it, but the sense of what was going on as being wrong, as capturing the national attention. I'm gonna stop it too. <laughs> um, but I think those are a couple ways. Um, I think in, if we look at the individual, well, I guess I'm going on the three, right? I've, I've been using a lot of threes tonight. Um, we'll blame that on churches and sermons and something of the like, right? Um, someone like a king, right? Um, just a small part of the story, uh, having the skills and education and ability to wed together, right? The best of, say, a kind of black Baptist tradition with the social gospel of, uh, in his, uh, social gospel tradition going back to the, you know, Walter Mulder and Walter Rauschenbusch, uh, so, and which draws on social scientific critiques of American society, Marxist discourse, as well within the rhetoric of the American dream, right, of the Constitution in a way that inspires more folk to attach and be involved and engage. So those, those are three things. We'll stop. Did, did I at least pass? More than pass. <laughs> I think we'll leave. The we'll leave.
<laughs> sorry, sorry, yes. That's a great question. I was not laughing at the question. That's a great question. <laughs> Does black, oh, black consciousness? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, for the two questions, one about one is about the future of black culture, black consciousness, and the first one was about Pat Robertson's very troubling commentary on why Haiti uh, has been relegated to the margins of the Western Hemisphere. Um, and for those of you who uh, haven't been following Pat Robertson. Uh, and so the question was also in terms of my own location as one who is ordained in a Christian church. Um, Robertson offered a, an, an explanation of Haiti's struggles uh, to a fact that they, and he claimed, right, this is historical fact, I'm fact checking, I, I, I don't know if anybody's got the facts on, that Haiti made a deal with the devil to basically to uh, overthrow French rule in, on the continent and that because they made a deal with the devil that is why they have struggled so since. Um, I don't think I can reconcile that uh, or, and I think, I, I guess I would say, um, I mean clearly we think about the connection to the uh, larger discourse around Haiti as voodoo land, right? that sees Christianity and a particular form of Christianity as the only legitimate religion in anything else, right? We think about the religious right and its power in this country over the last 30, 40 years. Um, and I think anyone, right, who identifies as a Christian is forced to wrestle with a larger history, right? For the way in which Christi, Christianity was at the center of justifications for the slave trade and for the continued uh, enslavement of black people in this country and at, so, right, at the center of so many uh, situations around power that, um, you know, Tobin and I were thinking about this, some of this work that I'm doing now are around marriage equality and black churches roles and, and what have you. Um, I think as one who has located himself within this t Christian story is, is, is that it's always a contestation, just as it's a, a challenge to uh, wrestle with what it means for us to be American, right? And I'm sure that many of us would not want to agree that Pat Robertson um, represents the America that we like to claim. I, I think I would say the same thing about the Christian faith, right? I'll, I'll take King over Pat Robertson. Um, so I, mean, I think that's part of what it is, but it's, it's, I think it's always a, a challenge um, to wrestle with the contradictions of those things that inform our identity, right? Um, and it's very difficult, deep, trouble, troubling things about some of those, those legacies that we inherit. Um, so the question of black culture and black consciousness, I mean, I think on one hand, right, in tying it to civil rights politics, there's a way in which still that is seen as the only authentic or legit legitimate way to be black, right? That if you're not engaged in some type of protest politics, then you're not black, right? We know Clarence Thomas is not really black. Um, I said that you heard the sarcasm, right? I, I hope. Now, I might not, lock the friends, not, not, might not like the fact that he's friends with uh, Rush Limbaugh, or I might not like his politics. I uh, certainly might have had a, a preferred choice for that seat. But I think there's a way in which we have to uh, limit the way in which what blackness is uh, and how blackness is understood, that has to be broadened, right? So we might not agree with Jay-Z, might not agree with, but there, but there's still, uh, black, right? And so there's been a lot of work in recent years to look at the ways in which that, right? And I think this is also a kind of part of reimagining the kind of a broader understanding of civil rights politics is, is understanding that kind of King was still a, very, a relatively small minority even within his black Baptist circles, right? In fact, him and his more progressive cohort were forced out of the National Baptist Convention, right? And so those kind of struggles to be, uh, while that's the kind of model that I would subscribe to, there has to be a way in which we understand that uh, our race, kind of race has to be understood in a broader sense. While we can still hold on to perhaps a kind of progressive vision in light of that racial history, right? So the grounds for solidarity may not be on uh, cultural uniformity, right? But more on a sense of shared struggle, shared experiences that 
um, might not solely be limited to race. I think we, um, yeah. Sure. I'm curious on your opinion on, uh, on the impact and influence of technology and, and, and the evolution of, I guess, the media overall and whether that's going to actually help racial relations in our country or actually solve them. Um, we're at a time now where uh, you can almost fit a media source to your beliefs or your parents' beliefs where, you know, in my generation, Gen Xer, you know, we were at least exposed to the Huxtable family on the Cosby Show, mm -hmm. where that created a national debate and discussion about some of these things. Where yeah. I, I, I'm not optimistic that we're going to maybe have some of those discussions anymore because, you know, we're now force fed by whatever, you know, media source we grew up on. And that's not necessarily a positive thing. Yeah, I think that's, a, I mean, I think you're exactly right in laying it out. I think on one hand, right, the internet is hailed as this great unifier and equalizer, but now we just tune into what we already believe, perhaps, right? So we don't hear the contrary position. We watch either Fox or MSNBC, right? Glenn Beck or uh, Keith Oberman, take your pick, right? And I may know who I like to watch, but it doesn't necessarily foster that conversation, right? And we see, right, as uh, even the challenges of that in someone like Obama's presidency in this effort to kind of ameliorate which I guess is not unique to him as an American president, but those divides are very real. Um, I mean, I think there are n numerous examples to point to individuals committed to, I think, important struggles who are using new technologies to uh, kind of as a ground for organizing, right? So I, the, the, the Jenna Six case in, in uh, Louisiana, there were a whole, uh, what's the, the, the term, net roots and internet bloggers who were using that as a tool to organize. Um, we might ask, though, how race plays, I mean, how um, class plays itself out in terms of how internet is consumed or utilized in these struggles as well. So, I mean, I, th I think you outlined the challenge as well as I could. Well, I, I, I would say that um, I would want to err on the side of being hopeful in the sense that organizing energy towards you, 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 me, engaging in that struggle. Right, rather than, I mean, I think it could go either way. But for those of us who want it to go in a better direction, then it's up to us to do it. Right? Yes, I just have a question about There was a lot to say about K pop culture, the white middle class. Yes. Um, what do you think of like, and you had a group like the Beastie Boys in the 80s when they came out and signed the Death Jam? They weren't even like, people didn't even know they were white until they actually saw them. They just viewed them like, you know, that's hip hop, that's what we embrace. Yeah. And then you have someone like Eminem who comes out later in the 90s, who kind of, you know, yeah, he didn't grow up in like, you know, Boston, you know, one of the five girls in New York, he grew up, you know, in a trailer park outside yeah. of Detroit. Yeah. He comes up and rises out. And don't you kind of feel now that it's already got to the point where it's kind of obvious that it, for the most part, like, for our generation, like middle class, even you know, lower upper, is pretty much embraced the pop culture entirely. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think in the same way that you point out this difference in technology, it's the same way hip hop's read yeah. as this great unifier of all folks uh, that everybody loves hip hop. Yet, and still, I think you know, there's work that's been done on how. Um, Hip hop as a kind of lifestyle associated with particular clothing has different consequences for how black and white young people live their lives and experience their lives. So, um, you know, so folks want to say hip, just don't listen to hip hop, but it's not a, it's necessarily about listening to hip hop, but for the consequences for walking through downtown Brooklyn late at night and having your pants sagging and wearing, you know, means two different things in terms of how a black young person. So, I mean, there's st race still matters in different ways, but at the same time, no, you know, I think what it also points to is the way in which hip hop is both perceived to be a kind of a, a, a racial cultural form, but there's always been a sense of how and what I think draws so many folks to hip hop is a sense that it communicates a struggle. Right, so what makes hip hop, makes someone like Eminem so appealing, what makes you root for him over the black guy in Eight Mile, right, is that because you can hear his pain, whereas this other cat is from privilege, right? And so it's a sense of, Right, struggle that eight, New York, New York, or eight million stories, or Eminem, regardless of racial uh, makeup, kind of personifies or embodies the sense of I'm struggling against great odds to make it. And uh, um, so, I, I mean, I think that's what Eminem captures that is true to hip hop, and that can't just be reduced to, you know, black folk. Do you think it's also kind of ironic that he's pushing for now, or he's becoming one of the highest, you know, his records are becoming you know, close to two five and babies in sales? Yeah, you know. He's the only white person to actually do that. Yeah, in fact, 
Yeah. But I know, like, you know, hip hop came from, you know, came from New York and started mm -hmm. break dancing and yeah. you're not interested in that. Even though we started out as you know, something that was, you know, kind of known by, you know, black people. It still kind of comes back to you know somehow the white or like white people end up getting. Oh, so you're suggesting that same in the same way yeah. that rock and roll like yeah. so uh, yeah no I think right that long history of co cultural co-optation is one narrative, um, but I, I mean, and maybe I'm biased. Um, there's a Eminem gets this, and Vanilla Ice doesn't right because Vanilla Ice is whack. Right, I mean, this, I mean, you know, this, I mean, this, right. So, I mean, there's a certain level, and whatever your race politics are, Eminem. What, I mean, he's got some, just he says some nonsense, but he does it in a way that you just like, dang, he's good, you know. So, I mean, I right, I mean, I think that history is there, and we, can, I think you're suggesting like, do we explain his popularity, in part because he has white privilege? I think that that that, that in fact, in, in the fact that he's an anomaly. Right, he's margin, perceived to be marginal within hop, hip hop, which makes his appeal and currency even greater. But then I think you can't discount the fact that hip hop is also perceived to be a meritocracy in the sense that if you have the skills, you know, you can do it. But if you don't, see you. Yeah, I mean that's that's a great. Yeah, yeah right. There. So this is a question about civil rights, and I wanted to know how you saw it. How you thought we should view Obama? Um, you, you were speaking mostly in terms of like it being a post-racial thing, and, I, and I'm wondering. You know, you know we live in this uh, this democracy, this republic, this representational democracy, where it seems that um, at least in the last couple decades, that money in the form of political action committees or lobbying, um, you know, corporate media seems to trump any sort of authentic popular movements, yep. and, and it does seem that um, Obama, uh, either, you know, uh, by design or by, you know, just sort of the, um, you know, the way the cards fell out, um, has, a, has a pretty close proximity to Wall Street and uh, to some of these big think tanks, like the Brookings Institute, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, his, some of his uh, closest advisors are, you know, members of some of the, the biggest, richest, uh, you could say greediest corp companies in America, and so it it makes me wonder, you know, especially after this recent Supreme Court ruling, you know, what does it matter the color of this guy's skin if he's just another power player in a, in a game that really most of us will never even be able to, you know, see how it's played. So I guess you know, how do you, how would you respond to that? Yeah, that's that's. I mean. Again, you all are raising questions that it sounds like you already have a very strong and accurate analysis of, right? I mean, Obama, um, very much product of American privilege in a lot of regards, right? He you know, graduates from Columbia, Harvard Law. He's allied with, in, 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 in some ways, uh, even though he kind of fashions his career by way of community activism and goes up that way as a kind of, uh, his kind of ascent, um, he's very much an elite. Right, and, um, and, and I think that's right. The, the promise symbolically of what it represents for America to get over this hump of being in a place to be able to um, elect a black man says much of where uh, the, the country has come, yet at the same time kind of reinforces the way in which class and these multinational corporations, right, that control just as much about hip hop, uh, uh, you know, message about hip hop gets out and, you know, why Eminem gets out there, but someone uh, who's putting out a more progressive message may not. Um, the way in which we're all part of this kind of broader matrix of late capitalism, if, if you will, um, whether academics or on corp, you know. Uh, and so he's representative of the American empire, right? Um, and all that that office presents. Um, so, I mean, it's the way in which kind of that matrix has space for different types of cultural commodities while keeping the larger structure in place. Um, do, can we get outside of that system? Uh, I think it's a good question. I think in some ways, you know, helpful for my thinking about this has kind of been worked by some cultural study theorists, that, the cultural studies theorists that focus on the fact that, you know, right, there's never a sum total win or gain, right? Perhaps that's some of the limits of kind of civil rights, black power politics is that kind of the, rev where's this revolution, right? 
and, and it, what's on the other side of the revolution in the, in the sense that we're always struggling uh, for, for wars of position, to you know, quote Stuart Hall, that we're, uh, we may not, that purity and this ideal uh, utopian may not be realized, but that doesn't uh, give us license to get off the battle and not you know, struggle to make it a better place. So do I think it makes a decided difference whether Obama's in the office or McCain and Palin, right? Yeah, I mean, shoot, if I think symbolically, even more than, you know, I, and I identify with Obama's African American, I thought it was just great to have someone in the office of the presidency that seemed to be committed to excellence. Political ideology aside, right? I mean, that, like, clearly, the, Obama as someone of privilege who ascends to the White House in W as someone of privilege. Who, it, it says two different messages. Um, yeah, so I, I'll take that position over the, the other. So that's a great question. Yes. Um, uh, I, I agree with John with uh, Howard Zinn and his assessment of uh, you know, Obama at one in the nation, that there's you know, a lot of work that needs to be done for him to, you know, actually realize the sort of revolutionary potential of uh, his campaign and of his history. But I also, I'm confused by the way in which this narrative, narrative of him as coming from privilege, the rhetoric of that seems to stick because that does not jive, for me at least, with his history at all. And it seems to me to be a kind of, you know, ploy on the part of the right to, you know, locate him as just another latte liberal. <laughs> yeah, 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 no. Right, no, and I think he made deliberate efforts, right, both to locate him in the story of a kind of, uh, uh, both the kind of immigra immigration narrative, kind of a you know, uh, story of his father coming to the country because of what it represented in terms of promise and possibility that his native land didn't. Um, also the story of his, his, you know, his mom's family is much, very much working class, and he becomes someone that because of his gifts, talents, and opportunities is able to make this climb. So I think in some ways it is a misnomer. Uh, to call him, it's not that he was born into the American elite, but I, I um, by my own experience, right, um, who is not, you know, from the South Bronx, um, but not also born into the intellectual elite, uh, into any elite, uh, I know the difference that it makes, how, like, like, that Harvard Law degree makes a big difference even if it was only three years of his life, right? And so entrance into that circle may not be a reality of his kind of his full life story, but it is in large part what makes possible, I think, what we know about who, who Obama is now. Does that make sense? I don't yeah, I think the 18th Brunner of uh, Mark's 18th Brunner would be a good place to go to answer this question. Well, I'm, I'm listening. Help me. Help me on this. I'm not going to go any further with the complexity of class. I mm -hmm. think class identification just isn't taking into account. Mm -hmm. um, in, in marketing and personal privilege, so yeah. that's not unique. So. Yeah, yeah. Why don't we take one more question? Sure. So, um, so none of this post-racial era is coming and all of these borders are breaking. <laughs> uh, um, and people are using more and more. Would you say that um, religion could be a more unifying factor in the U.S.? Hmm. I don't know if there's any evidence to suggest that. And, and I guess, you know, I don't, um, again, re religion has the potential to go either way, you know, whether you side with King or Pat Robertson. And, um, and, and, and it's much more complex than that simple right versus left, you know. Um, Clearly, in more recent years, evidence around religion has kind of suggested that it's a source more of tension and division. Um, but I think, I mean, it always, the, the folks that are part of those everyday religious communities um, have much to say about what space that plays, what place religion will play in this landscape. I was watching this morning the National Prayer Breakfast, or this afternoon, the National Prayer Breakfast, where uh, you know, there's this hope and there's talk about religious pluralism, but we know even Obama's campaign. How dare he be an, a Muslim, right? As if, and he needing to say, no, I'm not, as if it's a bad word, right? Uh, I mean, Christianity still, it, within the context of the United States, is very much the privileged religious identity. Um, 
We have a, uh, I guess, a Muslim congressman from Minnesota, but I venture to say it'd be a long time before we have a Muslim president. Um, so I think America has a lot of work still to do on that, even while many are saying this is the you know, land of religious pluralism. One is about religious diversity, but questions of power, just alongside of racial diversity, continue to matter just as much as the, the reality of cultural diversity, cultural and religious diversity. Can I mean give Dr. Stewart another round of applause? Thank you very much for coming and uh, have a good evening. <laughs>